Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Dr. Garcia Garcia, for agreeing to present for us. Dr. Garcia Garcia is a researcher at Clinique La Prairie in Switzerland. And her work focuses mainly on obesity, longevity, and brain health with regards to these issues. She has done her PhD in University of Barcelona, followed by a postdoc at Max Planck Institute in Germany and a second postdoc at MNI, where at the same time that I was doing my PhD. So I had the pleasure to work with uh, Isabel for quite a few projects. Her long-term goal is to look at environmental, biological, and psychosocial factors and how they contribute to successful aging and identify modifiable risk factors that can be worked on to help better, long, better aging. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for inviting me. I'm, I'm very excited to, to, to be online uh, in Montreal and, and it's always a, a pleasure to see you. Uh, so today I'm going to talk, as Yasha said, about obesity and, and brain health. And I'm going to try to go a bit on the possible mechanisms that are underlying this, this relationship. All right. So demographers have called it like the longevity revolution. Why? Because in the last 100 years, our life expectancy has augmented by 30 years. This is enormous, like never seen before. Um, with the COVID pandemic, however, there was a halting um, in, in all these signs. A lot of countries like, for example, the US, India, Chile, Spain or Belgium lost a whole year of like expectancy due to the mortality of, of COVID-19. Um, despite all that, in 2021, around 20% of European population, around 17% of North American population were aged 65 years or older. Um, however, these increases in life expectancy have not been completely matched or have not been matched at all by increases in health expectancy or increases in the health span. The health span is the amount of time that we spend in good health and or in the, or in the absence of frailty and diseases. As we can see here, overall global and the world life expectancy is supposed to be 73 years. Our health span, our life, uh, health adjusted life expectancy is supposed to be 64 years. So we, we spend uh, an average of nine years living with disability or living with diseases. For uh, medical reasons, for economical reasons, for social reasons, it's very important to reduce this gap. And it's very important to promote uh, good health in older ages. Um, so in older ages, what are the main causes of, of disability? Uh, well, this study from The Lancet identified that uh, neurological disorders, psychiatric disorders, overall like engloved as brain disorders can be uh, main causes of disability in, old, in older ages, specifically in participants, as we can see here, in participants that are 65 years or older, um, stroke and Alzheimer's disease become very important causes of disability. In addition to this, it's not in the graphic, but uh, in women older than 50 years old, uh, depressive disorders are also an important cause of, of disability, are among the top 10 causes. Um, all this led to the Lancet Commission to, um, to, to famously state in 2020 that a certain amount of, a considerable amount of cases of dementia, they estimated to be 40% of cases of, of total cases of dementia are potentially preventable um, because they are due to potentially modifiable risk factors. So in this uh, very nice graphic, they depicted here like the lifespan as if it was a river and with the higher part of this graphic representing early life, this other part representing midlife, and this other one represented later life. We can already see that in early life, uh, having a lower education is a risk factor for dementia later on in life. What happens in midlife? Well, in midlife, there are problems like hearing loss, like the traumatic brain injury, hypertension, excessive alcohol intake, and obesity would be the main drivers of dementia at later stages in life. So in this presentation, I'm going to focus uh, exclusively on obesity. 
And first, I will provide like a broad overview of how obesity might be associated with problems in general problems in brain health. And then I am going to share a meta-analysis that, that is currently under review where, where we tested at um, the possible role of adipokins. I'm going to talk about what are a bit later and how they might bridge this gap between obesity and um, Alzheimer's disease and other types of dementia. Um, so these are the results of a uh, meta-analysis that uh, we performed at McKeel under the supervision of Dr. of Dr. Dagger. And we found that across many studies performing voxel based morphometry, uh, whole brain voxel based morphometry, obesity was consistently associated with reduced gray matter volume. This uh, reduced reduced gray matter volume was mostly located in the medial prefrontal cortex, in the temporal uh, in the temporal lobe, and in the cerebellum. In order to, to validate these results in an external uh, data set, we extracted the value of the clusters that we obtained in the meta-analysis, and we tested in a different data set, we tested in the human collecton project, if these clusters were independently associated with body mass index. And we found that almost all of them were associated with body, with body mass index, validating the results of the meta-analysis, all of them except one in the left cerebellum. Um, but for the others, we validated the results. Using a very similar methodology, we also tested whether um, different studies uh, have consistent results regarding obesity in white matter, uh, in white matter um, microstructures, specifically in fractional anisotropy. And we found that across uh, many studies, obesity was associated with reduced fractional anisotropy in a small cluster in the corpus, in the genome of the corpus callosum. Following a very similar methodology than the other than the other study, we extracted this val this uh, cluster from from the meta analysis, and we tested again in a human collecton project if participants with obesity and individuals with normal weight differed or not um, in this cluster in terms of fractional anisotropy. And we found that individuals with obesity matching the results of the meta-analysis had lower fractional anisotropy in the genome of the corpus callosum compared to normal weight participants. In another study, we also uh, looked, we focused a bit more on subcortical volume and specifically we focus on the nucleus accumbens because it's a region that has like special interest for obesity research that it's associated with food motivation and valuation. And we found that across many studies, um, obesity had very small differences in the nucleus accumbens. However, what we found and was a bit more important was that the differences were highly dependent on the age of the participants. So uh, studies that recruited younger participants tend to find that participants with obesity had higher accumbens volumes than, than um, normal weight participants. While participants, uh, studies that recruited older participants, participants with obesity at older ages were, uh, were having lower cortical, uh, lower subcortical volume in the, in the accumbens compared to lean participants. Again, we validated the results, this time with the UK Biobank, and we found that the nucleus accumbens was associated with, with obesity. We also wanted to test whether this association was done um, with the trajectory of obesity. So like if we had like um, longitudinal measurements of obesity over time, if if an increase in these measurements was associated with, with worse outcomes in the comments, but we couldn't find anything. And we just found uh, cross-sectional associations with, with the overall um, value of body mass index. So how is obesity causing uh, these, these differences in the brain or why is, that, is it associated? Because we don't really talk about causality. Why is it associated with these differences in the brain? One of the hypotheses is that obesity, or more specifically abdominal obesity, is triggering a set of uh, metabolic conditions that in turn are associated with, with poorer brain health. So it is very possible that metabolic of, um, that abdominal obesity is causing uh, worse outcomes in inflammation, tends to trigger or worsen insulin resistance, also tends to trigger or worsen uh, hypertension and dyslipidemia. All these factors, 
<laughs> excuse me, um, alone individually or in synergy with the others are probably affecting the integrity of the vascular system and probably are causing uh, cerebral hypo, hypoperfusion. As a result of this, the cells of the brain might not get the adequate oxygen and nutrients that they need. And this might in turn be associated at the end with uh, diminished gray and, and white matter integrity. Um, this, however, we couldn't, we haven't been able to test yet experimentally, so it remains a, a hypothesis. So as an interim summary, uh, this is more or less like the uh, the, equ the equator of, of the talk. Obesity is cross-sectionally associated with lower gray matter volume and with uh, differences in white matter microstructure. The magnitude of these differences is small, and we still have a bit of a lack of information on the temporal relationship of the changes that we observe. It is in this context that we performed uh, another study called Assessing Adipokines as Potential Biomarkers of Dementia, Alzheimer's Disease, and Mild Cognitive Impairment, which is a systematic review and a meta-analysis. All right, so here uh, we looked at the effects of adipokines as a possible bridge between obesity and cognitive impairment. What are adipokines? Adipokines are like uh, thousands, uh, sorry, hundreds of molecules that are secreted by the adipose tissue. That's why they are called adipokines and that they exert their effects via uh, endocrine or para or paracrine um, mechanisms. They affect, they exert the effect, their effects in the, um, in the, in the uh, both in the central and in the peripheral nervous systems. So the two main adipokines here that we are gonna focus on are leptin and adiponectin. So leptin is primarily secreted by the white adipose tissue uh, in, in the abdominal area. Um, leptin is a hormone that what it does is that it signals uh, satiety. So when the organism has high levels of blood leptin, it tends to reduce the amount of food intake. It signals it's a satiety um, factor. Um, peripheral leptin can be transported uh, to the uh, through the uh, central nervous system since it crosses easily the blood brain, brain barrier. However, and there's a caveat here, um, the levels of leptin that we observe in blood may or may not completely match the levels of leptin that we observe in the nervous system and the central nervous system. And it is because in the, the hypothalamus is also secreting a small amount of, of leptin. So we think, we tend to think that there's gonna be like a coincidence but there might be a bit of a, of a mismatch. What is the role of, the, of leptin in the central nervous system? Well, uh, leptin, is, uh, leptin receptors are highly expressed in the hypothalamus and in the hippocampus. In the hypothalamus, it's supposed to help with homeostatic processes. And in the hippocampus has been shown to be, um, to be able to promote synaptic uh, density in the hippocampus. So it's supposed to have some sort of uh, neuroprotective effect. Adiponectin is, a, is another like adipokin that uh, this time this, this uh, molecule is exclusively, exclusively uh, secreted by the adipose tissue. So it doesn't have secretion in, in other places. Um, adiponectin is depleted. So the levels of adiponectin are lower in people that has certain metabolic conditions, like for example, people with obesity, people with type 2 diabetes, or people with chronic inflammation. Um, it has strong anti-inflammatory effects, and this is why it is. Uh, it has been hypothesized that uh, lower um, lower levels of adiponectin might be uh, promoting an increase of, of inflammation, and this might in turn be associated with uh, higher risk of neurodegenerative disorders such as Alzheimer's disease. What happens in obesity? Obesity is defined by a state in which um, it has a resistance to, to leptin. Resistance means that the body stops reacting to leptin. So although the levels of leptin are high in obesity because they are secreted by the adipose tissue, the body is not reacting to them. So it's not, leptin is not exerting its function as a society signal. In addition, like other meta, uh, metabolic abnormalities, obesity is also associated with lower levels of adiponectin. 
in theory, um, leptin resistance and low adiponectin might be affecting certain hallmarks of Alzheimer's pathology, like for example, creating neuronal ins insulin resistance, uh, increasing neuroinflammation, promoting synapse loss and impaired synaptic plasticity. Oops, sorry. And ultimately causing a cognitive decline and memory loss. So because of this reason, we performed a, a meta-analysis to analyze whether alterations in, adipo, in adipokins, mostly leptin and, and adiponectin, were associated with diagnostic of Alzheimer's disease or mild cognitive impairment, or with prospective risk uh, of getting uh, dementia, getting Alzheimer's disease, or getting mild cognitive impairment. Here, we included two types of studies. We included, on the one hand, studies compared, comparing uh, the group of interest, so that means uh, the group of people with Alzheimer's disease or with general dementia and cognitive control participants, and so case control studies. And we also included uh, uh, longitudinal cohorts where they were evaluating um, um, adipokin levels at baseline and they were uh, looking at the risk of prospective development of, of dementia or mild cognitive impairment. So what we found, in case control studies, evaluating blood leptin levels across people with Alzheimer's disease and across cognitive control participants, we found that participants with Alzheimer's disease had consistently lower levels of blood leptin compared to, to controls. The combined uh, coency was 0.65. Studies comparing people with mild cognitive impairment and cognitive control participants were uh, smaller in number and were also more heterogeneous in results. So we could not find group differences, consistent group differences in leptin levels between mild people with mild cognitive impairment and cognitive controls. We also saw a correlation between blood leptin and cognitive impairment in that uh, higher blood leptin was associated with better scores um, in cognitive screening tests, such as the mini mental uh, state examination or the MOCA test. So this is with regards to leptin. With regards to adiponectin, we did the same methodology. First, we compared people with Alzheimer's disease uh, versus cognitive controls, and we did not find any difference in blood adiponectin levels between these two groups. So there were no case control differences in adiponectin. Regarding patients with mild cognitive impairment, uh, we also didn't find any difference, any group difference between patients with mild cognitive impairment and cognitive controls in, in blood adiponectin levels. We then um, performed a systematic review of the literature. We have loved to do a meta-analysis here, but there was no, not enough studies on whether um, and baseline levels of adipokins, so that means baseline levels of leptin and adiponectin were associated with higher risk of um, dementia or Alzheimer's disease. So uh, first, let's look at leptin. We found that two studies found that lower leptin levels at baseline were associated with higher risk of uh, having dementia uh, in the follow-up, while two studies found no, uh, no results. With regards to leptin, there were only two studies available, and none of the studies found an association between blood leptins, uh, blood adiponectin levels at baseline and prospective risk of dementia and Alzheimer's disease. So how do how can we interpret a bit uh, the results of uh, leptin and Alzheimer's disease? Well, there are two interpretations, right? Like uh, weight loss and its consequent decreases in leptin is often seen as a preclinical sign of Alzheimer's disease. And some authors have interpreted it as a preclinical sign. So weight loss seems to precede 
uh, dementia and some authors have interpreted it as a risk factor. So weight loss at later age might bring some risk factor for, for Alzheimer's disease. So maybe the results that we observed that uh, people with Alzheimer's disease have consistently lower blood leptin levels that cognitive control participants would be just due to that, to the fact that they that people with Alzheimer's disease have tended to lose weight right before developing dementia. At the same time, and maybe complementary to this, leptin also has some neuroprotective effects and it seems to support synaptic function in the hippocampus. So maybe these uh, lower uh, leptin levels that we observe in Alzheimer's disease are uh, exacerbating the Alzheimer's pathology. There are certain limitations that are common to the studies that we have seen. Uh, well, the first of all is representativeness of the samples. So um, volunteers that come to the, to the studies are usually um, healthier, are usually more educated, are usually wealthier than people in the in the, norm, in the common population. Um, so we always lose a bit of representativeness of the sample. Um, for budget reasons, studies are usually con um, conducted with very short follow-ups. We see that there are very little longitudinal studies. The ones that are there have very short follow-ups, usually between one and three years. So for this reason, there's also like a lack of information in middle-aged participants. We still don't, do not know if leptin or adiponectin levels in middle age are associated with risk of Alzheimer in later age. Um, and there's also a big limitation of our meta-analysis is that we could not really distinguish between amnesic and other forms of MCI since amnesic form of MCI is the one that is more often associated with risk of Alzheimer's disease. So as conclusions, and our cross-sectional results showed that lower uh, that people with Alzheimer's disease compared to cognitive control tend to have lower blood leptin levels. And the longitudinal results are still pretty unclear whether blood leptin predicts prospective risk of Alzheimer's disease or not. Um, this was all. Thank you very much for having me. It's, it's been a pleasure. If you have any questions, I'll be very happy to, to answer. So I, I may have one question. So can you talk through how you did the meta-analysis with uh, the diffusion MRI data? I've never seen that technique done before. Is it using the Enigma protocol or how, how did you use the TPSS kind of framework to do the meta-analysis uh, in, the, in, in the diffusion MRI study? Um, yeah, um, I we did with the same amazing software than the green matter now, I don't remember it. Um, but, but yeah, basically like, uh, there's like the, uh, in the meta-analysis there, in the software, there's incorporated like the skeleton of the diffusion, uh, the, of the diffusion data. And then, uh, yeah, one enters the, the coordinates and the, and the end of the participants as, as input. Um, so, so it's always like with studies that are performed uh, in cold brain analysis using the tensor model. This has to be um, very equivalent be between them. Excellent. But uh, if I'm su super honest, um, the meta analysis this, that meta analysis I didn't do. It was uh, I was a collaborator. So although I was involved in the analysis, I don't really remember the specifics, but I kind of remember that, that there was like the TBSS uh, model template uh, with the skeleton, and then you enter the, the coordinates and the, and the sample size. Uh, because you're, maybe you're concerned about uh, some of the... I don't know, I just, I'm just not familiar with the technique. I mean, I, for volumes or critical thickness, I've, I've, I've seen a bit of that, but, uh, um, but, but yeah, no, I've just never seen it in this technique itself. Um, there's, there's a question from the chat. Do you want to read it? Oh, yeah, I don't have. Oh, yeah, okay. sorry. <laughs> so uh, I'll read it out. Thanks for the great presentation, Dr. Garcia. I may have missed it in the presentation, uh, but what uh, research techniques are used to detect leptin in the blood? Yeah, yeah. So we didn't really differentiate between studies detecting leptin in plasma versus studies detecting leptin in serum. If that is a question, um, because we we consulted here with a um, 
with a lab and they told us that more or less the the results should be should be equivalent um, that that leptin results are, are usually pretty pretty equivalent doesn't matter if it's leptin coming from serum or leptin coming from from plasma i'm not sure if the question comes uh is a bit uh, around that but yeah they might be a bit of differences and we maybe we could control for that actually in the analysis i have a question do we have these measures in any of the bigger data sets like ADNI? Do they have leptin measures? I don't know. I don't. Uh, so um, let me think. Let me think. Let me think. In the ADNI, yeah, because there are like several studies performed in it. That's another thing that um, there are like many studies performed in the ADNI. So I could just include like one of them, you know, because you cannot include. Uh, I, I could just include the most representative one. And there's also leptin in the the Rotterdam um, data set. So yes, there's there's some. The reason I'm asking is now they have like longer follow-ups, like more recently, and you can look at baseline and then try to look at the ADNI for the final visit is 12 years now? Yeah, you do have subjects. That 12 have years, okay. that's very nice. So, that, that okay. can be interesting. Yeah, they, it's getting to the sample sizes that you can actually start looking at these things. I also have a question. Um, in both this figure and the previous one, um, I, I feel like there is some asymmetry. There are a lot more results. All of the results are in the left hemisphere. Well, not all of them, though, but some of like there is, most of the results are on the left hemisphere. Do you? Do you know of any like lateral? Is it basically like is there any asymmetry um, in the pattern of the like atrophy related to obesity, or is this just do you have any hypothesis why? So so now that I know, um, I I know that there has been like in the past certain studies, um, suggesting that obesity would be associated with an asymmetry, but I don't really remember the rationale. And after like, I couldn't really ever find anything about it, like in my analysis, so I kind of forgot about this theory. And now that you mentioned it, yeah, maybe. So it could be interesting to, to test for it, uh, but I'm not sure. Do you have any idea of um, asymmetry in Alzheimer's disease or something like that? I, I don't think it's like that clear. Huh? Um, in Alzheimer's, it's a bit tricky because um, so one of the like there is asymmetry in general, but um, it might be a sam like sampling recruitment bias because the symptoms are more um, like it would it would translate into differences in symptoms and um, for example language symptoms uh, huh. might be more easier to pick up um, so. It's, it's a bit tricky in Alzheimer's, but we can, it, it, I think it's something that we can look at. We can definitely look in the healthy population with different DMIs. Like yeah. There's a, I think Lonnie had a question. Uh, yeah, I was just curious um, what you think are, I guess, the biggest challenges in the literature right now, or what are the biggest gaps that like would still need to be filled for you to um, be able to like, I guess, um, more definitively say whether you think that there is like this very strong uh, relationship. Yeah, so so the, the problem of the short follow-ups um, is also the, the issue that if you don't do a, a long follow-up enough, uh, whatever you find, you might never be able to, to say if it's due, if it's like a risk factor or if it's just due to some sort of um, subclinical neurodegen neurodegeneration that is already taking place. So you might think that a risk factor for dementia in, in later stage uh, is a risk factor for dementia, but um, if, if you're not measuring uh, this factor with, with, uh, with a certain follow-up after certain timing of follow-up, it might, it might just be uh, the reverse causality, right? So it might just be the neurodegeneration causing the existence of this factor. So I think that this is like a, a big issue, not only in, in obesity research, but also like in other types of research, like for example, the relationship between physical activity and dementia or the relationship between uh, certain nutritional patterns and dementia. Uh, like for example, there's like a lot of studies saying that people that tend to, to move less tend to have higher risk of obesity, but sorry, higher risk of Alzheimer's disease, but maybe it's the other way around too. Maybe it's the fact that uh, people with, Alzheimer, with subclinical Alzheimer's disease uh, just stop moving at, at, the, at the time that they are tested. That they are tested. 
so I think that um, longer follow-ups are really the key and I understand that yeah for budget um, problems it's very difficult to obtain. Cindy, Cindy online has a question. Uh, yeah, I have a question. I was wondering in, uh, it's a little bit related with Lenny's question, but I was wondering if um, there are, or you have found any information on how, what's the impact of fluctuations in weight, like along life, uh, because sometimes many people with uh, this um, tendency to have, to promote health by losing weight, there is always like this, um, like effort to lose weight and then you made when it gain it back and I don't know if there are studies evaluating the impact of that. Yes, yeah, so I haven't really seen um, studies in evaluating the, the impact of of weight fluctuations uh, in the brain or not that I know. But yes, yeah, certainly it's is very important. Um, on the other hand, like weight fluctuations um, they might have a very strong psychological uh, component, right? Because it might it might be people like really trying to lose weight or really having like certain eating patterns that that are are not uh, allowing them to uh, to be consistent in in this. So uh, so I'm not sure if per se they would be more harmful uh, to brain health or. Um, or if they might be like certain uh, psychological characteristics behind that, that that might influence them, maybe. But it's it's a very nice yeah it's it's a very nice uh, area of research actually for future direction. Thank you. No, I I have, I have one more question if that's okay. Um, so one of the things that strikes me in in this research is that. You know, the middle age or kind of post middle age obesity absolutely is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. But then, kind of getting closer to the disease itself, it's actually a rapid decline in in weight that becomes a risk factor. So, how do have you have you thought about how those two parts of the trajectory yeah. kind of play out uh, in your in, in kind of what you're proposing here? Yeah. So I think it might be still a bit of, again the problem of reverse causality. I have a bit of issues understanding the fact that uh, loss of weight is causing dementia. I think that um, that there might be like some uh, subclinical neurodegeneration coming behind the uh, coming before the dementia that is causing the the loss of weight and not and not the other way around. And also like let's remember that people with Alzheimer's disease also had like a lot of problems in swallowing, uh, so that might also cause uh, malnutrition at at some point. Um, so I don't think that, um, well, as a physician, you should recommend, you should just like not recommend a participant that is overweight or, or has weight problems to lose weight when they are in old adulthood, just in case they will develop Alzheimer's disease, because I don't think that that would be the case. I think that maybe these people, um, uh, are losing weight because of the subclinical neurodegeneration. Since our follow-ups are not long enough and it's very difficult to control for this, um, yeah, people sometimes tend to attribute the loss of weight to a possible cause, but um, it's not clear. Uh, what is clear is that it precedes Alzheimer's disease, but it might not cause Alzheimer's disease per se. So thanks a lot, Dr. Garcia.